spinal deformity and oh, correction. Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? Because we had some yes. logistic trouble, so and I had to talk over my iPhone. I so we, we, we're, gonna, we're gonna start to, uh, uh, with an introduction, my uh, partner, David Casper is going to give an overview of uh, the uh, coronal uh, imbalance uh, for the uh, spinal deformity surgery. So David, uh, who joined us recently, is going to give us this overview and then uh, we we'll take over and we we'll get the fellows to present cases as we wanted to this uh, to be mostly case based. Great, thank you, Vince. Um, I appreciate the introduction. For those of you that don't know me, I'm uh, Dave Casper. Uh, I just recently joined Penn, uh, so excited to be here as a new staff. Um, and so it was interesting. I was talking to Dr. Uh, Ziegler earlier about trying to find a, a new uh, case conference. Interesting topic. It seems like we've kind of gone through the gamut a lot and it's been great. Um, but so we ended up settling on uh, coronal imbalance. Oftentimes, you know, you, we debate a lot about SVA and positive sagittal alignment and those sorts of things. And sometimes the coronal plane gets overlooked. And so really our, our goals tonight are kind of to discuss some of the issues that present in terms of recognizing coronal decompensation. And then of course, um, priority one is, is do no harm and, and try not to to cause some of this during some of our uh, adult deformity or um, idiopathic patient correction. And then if, if unfortunately we do create it, also uh, treatment modalities for these kinds of situations. Um, so some of my mentors uh, in Cleveland, especially Doug Orr would tell me, uh, every spine operation is a deformity operation. You're either preventing it, you're either creating it, which unfortunately we do sometimes, or you're correcting it. Um, so a key thing to remember in, in, in most cases, you wanna do no harm and make sure that we're addressing these curves in, in three dimensions. Um, so this is uh, one particular case, just to, to highlight some of those things is, you know, you see a patient here, comes to your clinic, obviously some adjacent segment disease. You do a nice case, you look at the SVA, you're giving everyone high fives, and then all of a sudden, you look at your AP view and, you know, the patient's leaning way off to the side and then you're, you're left scratching your head. So obviously, you know, uh, there's been quite a bit of, of literature uh, on this topic. Um, this is an article out of the Global Spine Journal kind of highlighting some of the um, risk factors, whether it be patient size, whether it be fusion levels. Um, and obviously, if you get this right, patients do well. Um, so it's important to take all these things into consideration and then also how do you help prevent some of these issues? Is it, you know, are you using interoperative scoliosis films and those sorts of things? Um, and then once, once you do unfortunately have a coronal issue, um, whether it's iatrogenic or whether it's something that you're treating um, and analyzing preoperatively, the discussion comes to how are you gonna treat this? Are you gonna try and do something a little bit smaller like a, a mini open pedicle subtraction osteotomy? Um, are you doing asymmetric uh, three column osteotomies? There's been a lot of literature uh, in regards to these um, and varying degrees of, uh, of success. Um, and then made popular by Dr. Lanky, are you considering something like a kickstand rod? So there's a kind of a three-pronged um, approach that we're gonna do for the agenda tonight. And first it's kind of recognizing these issues as they prevent, present and then uh, trying to avoid them when it comes to it. So with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Olay, and hopefully he can touch on some of his uh, pearls that he's picked over, over the past, you know, 30 odd years. Vince? Uh, th thank you, David. So I'm going to need to ask a next for each slide, okay? So, um, so the, um, in the pediatric world, it's often a mistake of judgment, intellectual mistake that we do when we create an imbalance. It's a wrong level of fusion. We may have an adding on get crankshaft, too much correction on the curve, or obviously have a construct failure of psoriasis. Next. Get the next slide. So let's see a wrong level of fusion. This uh, patient who had uh, this uh, uh, double major curve. And uh, next. Side benders. Next. And the fusion was too short. It was a stop short of the stable vertebra, T11. And you can see that postoperatively, the patient was markedly uh, decompensated to the left. So this is one lesson of uh, too short of fusion and not fusing to the stable vertebra, which was 
T12 or L1 in this case can end up in the decompensation. Next. Well, how about adding on? Obviously, when we're young, we want to do a, a short fusion and get the spine as straight as possible. This is a case of mine where I uh, thought I would do a great job. Uh, side benders and this uh, pediatric patient thinks she was falling at the time. Next. So I stopped at uh, L1, as you can see. The post op looked fantastic. I was very happy with the result. Six weeks, I was still happy. And then at one year follow up, I was not happy anymore. Uh, three years, that's what happened. And the patient went into adding on because they did too short a fusion, especially that uh, this patient was young and was more at risk to add on. So once again, too short a fusion, didn't follow the rules of uh, getting to the stable vertebra. And I had add on on this case. Next. So I did side banders film. See so the spine was still supple, and I extended the fusion down, lower down, next to L3, and then the patient had a good result. Next, how about crank shafting? This uh, patient had uh, a previous uh, fusion when she was uh, uh, 11 or 12, I believe, and then she had this time the heart shield triangle. A rectangle, excuse me. And she went on just uh, growing post, um, anteriorly and getting a crankshaft. I had to revise. Next. Did multiple spinal, that's the side benders. Did multiple spinal salamis. Next. And could get the acceptable, a good result without uh, too, many, too much instrumentation, as you can see. As soon as you do a, a good smith pieces and osteotomy in this age group, you can get very good correction without uh, having particular screws right and left, uh, bottom to top and top to bottom, even in a previously operated spine. Next. That was a regular crank trap. Okay, so next. Now how about too much correction? This is a, a patient of mine. I did this uh, double curve. The side banders show the curve from 80 degrees to 50 degrees. Next. Dr. Arlay, can you make sure the volume is turned down on one of your devices? We're getting a slight echo. Okay, so I can just go, uh, let me see, it's on the microphone mostly. Um, let me... I think we're picking up one of your devices, either the laptop, so if you just turn the yeah. volume down on your laptop. Okay, so let me just close one. Is it better like this? I think so. Okay, um, but now I've lost all the uh, all my slides. I have uh, <laughs> slides. Oh dear. Okay, I oh, know that's it. I got them on my iPhone, so it's still good. So I, I see what we're doing. So maybe I'm just only gonna follow on my iPhone. So this is a, a patient of mine. Why? Therefore, I did a, a fusion from the top to L4, uh, from T3 to L4, with a very good correction of the two curve, at least on the X-rays. But you could see that the post-op, the patient has a significant left shoulder elevation. And the only way she can bring the shoulder down is to listing a, a back to the side. So I thought it was not a good result. The patient was unhappy. So I took it down and increased the main thoracic curve uh, because I had done too much correction of the main thoracic curve. Did some compression distraction. And then right after, when she got up afterwards, the shoulders were balanced and the patient were also perfectly balanced. This demonstrates that in some cases, we do too much correction of one curve to the other one. And this leads to imbalance, either as the shoulder imbalance or coronal imbalance or both. Next. So you may have a, a retinal proxarthrosis next. So the, in this case, uh, this uh, patient had a previous uh, uh, surgery and was imbalanced to the right side. And uh, she had a psoarthrosis and I did, had to revise her to do multiple smith pitt osteotomies. Uh, next. Side benders uh, show that obviously this uh, part of the curve was uh, rigid, but the side benders were mostly done to appreciate the, the flexibility of the lumbosacral curve. Next. And that's a result afterwards we could achieve 
a good balance of patient. That was she had some residual post op imbalance right after the surgery. Over the course of one year, she got much better. So this is for the pediatric spine. So let's take a look at now at the imbalance in the adult side. Next. So in the adult side, you have to do a very good pre-op evaluation of your deformity. Uh, you have to do intra-op prevention of the um, uh, deformity. And then sometimes you have to do a post-operative correction of your coronal imbalance. Next. So I'm going to take this case uh, only to demonstrate sometimes how complex it is to correct the coronal imbalance. This is the patient I'm going to operate in two weeks. This is a patient who had a burst fracture of L5. It was used uh, from L3 to S1 with the cage putting on posteriorly. And eventually he ended up with a fusion from L1 to S1 as the patient was imbalanced and the surgeon thought that it was one way to rebalance him. But obviously it's the oblique takeoff that the patient has. And then he underwent, he, he un he developed this secondary scoliosis over the years to rebalance him. And when you look at him clinically, this patient has a pelvic obliquity coming from the spine. It's not coming from his lower extremities. It's because his uh, overall trunk is tilted to his pelvis that he has, he has this pelvic obliquity and he's standing like this. And if you look at his lower extremities, we can measure it. Uh, they have exactly the same length. One leg is in abduction and the other one in adduction because that's the only way you can stand up. So how are we gonna be able to correct this patient? So the first thing we have, there's an oblique takeoff. We're gonna to need to get rid of the oblique takeoff. So we're gonna to need to do some osteotomy in the lower lumbar spine, probably right above the cage. And then uh, if we only do this, it's going to uh, be uh, tilting too much to uh, the left side. So we're going to need, at the same time, we do the oblique uh, takeoff correction of the um, lumbosacral spine. We're going to need to correct the scoliosis. But fortunately, the scoliosis is a support. Next, please. Uh, that's a, you see a CT myelogram that shows it has a solid diffusion uh, from the uh, L1 to uh, the sacrum. Next. And that's before and the rods were removed in this patient that the surgeon would treat it him. I want to remove the rods. Next, but this obviously didn't get them in any better. So when you correct this uh, uh, coronal deformity in the patient, it's essential that you start when you're doing your surgery with a very good uh, prepping and draping. It's, this is a wrong draping on your left-hand side. The good uh, prepping and draping, you pr have to prep and drape the whole back, including the shoulders and the pelvis. It's absolutely essential that you, because that's the only way you're gonna be able to judge your correction of deformity. And remember that if you leave a fusion down to the sacrum, two or three degrees of, of obliquity at the bottom, it's going to translate in lots of uh, lateral translation at the top. Next. And, and this is the prepping I do for all the patients with deformity, whether I do a pelvis to L2 fusion, or I do a pelvis to T2, I prep the whole back down to the bolsters. And then I mark uh, marks on, on with a pen to see where the pelvis is. So at the end, I can judge where my correction is. And anything shorter than this prepping would lead to coronal imbalance. That's the only way you can judge coronal imbalance. You can obviously take x-rays if you want, uh, but the x-rays, it's uh, very often operator dependent, the technician dependent. Uh, clinically, this is what you have. This is what you make. And uh, when you're used to it, it's a very good way to control the um, the correction next. So that's a way to, to take x-rays. If you want, you can just slide the x-rays and to interrupt x-rays at the end of your correction to make sure you don't have not induced coronal imbalance and pelvic obliquity. Next. And that's when a way we'll show it next, uh, how to correct a coronal uh, imbalance on the patient next. Okay, so more than to give you uh, further talks about coronal imbalance in the adult patients, I think we should get the, the fellows to uh, give uh, their talks. And I think, uh, uh, so who is the first uh, fellow to give his uh, case presentation? Because uh, with my technical problem, I had the computer, I couldn't just get the order. So Steve, you're on. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks, Dr. Arlay. Um, so as a good, nice segue into this, this is an adult uh, coronal imbalance uh, case. Um, I don't know, do I have control over, or Dave, do you, are you gonna drive? 
Oh, I think I do. Okay. So the first case that we're going to uh, talk about is a 70 year old female um, who presented to clinic with this uh, uh, ongoing back pain and lower extremity symptoms, specifically it's about 50% back, 50% lower extremity. She had notable neurogenic claudication. She had failed conservative treatment measures and on physical exam, she had this notable right thoracolumbar prominence um, as well as some notable coronal imbalance with pelvic obliquity. But this pelvic obliquity, again, as Dr. Arlay mentioned, is, is it spine-based or pelvic-based or leg lengths appear to be grossly symmetric and it, may, it must have been coming from the spine. So the plan for her was that they were, uh, we were going to do an L4 to S1 ALIF and um, instrument her from T4 to the pelvis to correct her deformity. Um, the symptoms that she was complaining of, uh, again, not advancing. All right, here we go. Uh, was that she had notable significant stenosis uh, distally um, uh, along her curve, as you can see in these images. And um, this was her correction. However, prior to discussion of any kind of operative osteotomies or any technical or surgical planning to correct this, uh, she came to, um, well, initially she came to clinic with some coronal imbalance that we could uh, attempt to correct simply with a, um, uh, some blocks under her foot. And she had some three centimeters of coronal um, uh, uh, tilt that we address with a 1.5 centimeter uh, uh, block under her short um, side and uh, she corrected very well and she actually went on to having no complaints and we didn't require any further treatment for this. And about uh, five years post-operative, she seems to be doing extremely well with just a little bit of a shoe lift. Not advanced. Great, thank you, Stefan. Um, Vince, quick question to you. How often do you find that, uh, that patients that have post-operative iatrogenic coronal imbalance, how often do you find these shoe lifts um, or something along those lines a little less invasive uh, end up working out? I, I think uh, it is something we neglect too often. Uh, very often these patients come with a sagittal imbalance. We do the correction and then we end up with uh, some coronal imbalance. And it's a good thing to spend two minutes in the clinic and try blocks and see how they feel uh, with a one centimeter shoe lift, two centimeter shoe lift, and they feel a, a better. I just tell them, why, why don't you just keep it on? And it's, it's, uh, many times the patients say, yeah, sure, it feels a little bit better. And they give them a prescription for one centimeter shoe lift. And, and that helps uh, your x-rays, <laughs> it looks better. And the patient, as a matter of fact, do slightly better. So it's to convert a very good result into an excellent result uh, with a simple method for a shoe lift if your coronal decompensation is small and moderate. Yeah, I absolutely agree. It's, you know, anytime that you can avoid an operation, especially after someone that's already had, you know, a significant uh, adult deformity surgery, it's always nice to do so. And um, if you offer them a shoe lift and they come back, you know, for their next follow-up visit at six weeks and they're all smiles, that's certainly a win in my department. Um, if there's if there's no other questions, do we want to go on to the next case, Stefan? We'll, we'll try and get through as many of these as we can just to, to bring up some of the finer points. Let me ask one question. Uh, this is Jan. So this is a terrific case and beautifully done. So my question to the group is, and to um, Vincent, uh, do we still use lateral bending films in adults? I know in pediatrics it was kind of the norm, but for these lumbar curves, understanding the dynamic capability and uh, and all that is so important. And uh, again, what do we do if a patient has a flexion contract of a hip? Do we fix that first? I know it's a loaded question. So let's stay with the lateral bending uh, question first. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, you might. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to take it on. Uh, I, I don't do a benders in, in the adult the patient, but I look very carefully at the, all the supine imaging study that I have. Uh, and in most cases, the CT scan. And very often they have a a scout view on the CT scan where you see the whole spine and this gives you already the impression of what you're going to get when the patient is on the uh, Jackson table or on the proaxis table. Uh, I'm not sure the side bender are very useful in the adult, especially when if you want to fuse them to the sacrum. It's, uh, uh, I mean, you, it doesn't hurt you to do them, but uh, it, it's uh, very often these old people, you have to it's very difficult for them to, to get the x-ray standing and so you're going to get them the side benders. I'm not sure the value of the side bender in this old population. Uh, 
I'm not arguing. I, I agree, and uh, it's just, I just wanted to tap into your knowledge base. Um, I really uh, appreciate your thoughtful approach towards lower extremity uh, influences on pelvic obliquity and uh, hip flexion contractors. What I struggle with is exactly what you said: uh, hip flexion contractors, adduction contractors, things like that. What are your thoughts on trying to release those if the hip joints are in relatively good shape first, or is that something that's just uh, going to have to work its way out with PT? Thank you. So, so I think this is very important to, to decipher exactly where this problem is coming from. And, and, and now we have the EOS, we have a much better understanding of what's going on. Because the first thing you can measure the leg length discrepancy on the EOS machine to see if you have a true leg length discrepancy or you don't have a true leg length discrepancy. And then you can see if your pelvic obliquity is coming from the spine or if it's coming from the lower extremities. And then you just with the x-rays uh, uh, posted on your computer, you examine the patient, you see they have a true uh, abduction, abduction uh, contractors, uh, uh, tensor fascial allergies contractors. And it's... Uh, uh, in most cases, I find that uh, it's, uh, it's coming from the spine and there's, uh, you have some length discrepancy that gives you oblique, uh, pelvic obliquity, but in the adult patient, uh, true abduction, abduction contractures like we see in, a, in CP patient, it's pretty rare as a matter of fact. You may see that sometimes after total hip replacement where there's been too much tension uh, to stabilize the hip. Uh, so the hip is unstable, so they get a little bit too long uh, prosthesis, and then you get some abduction contract to ABD, uh, and then there is induced pelvic obliquity. Uh, so we see that after total hip replacement sometimes, and that's uh, something that needs to be stretched, and uh, you have to work to talk to your uh, arthroplasty colleague. So great, great comments, Vince. Um, we had one other quick question from the chat in regards to uh, use of hooks at the UIV. Uh, in the last case, you decided to use screws versus hooks. Do you have any comment on when you use um, when you use hooks at the UIV versus screws? I mean, this is an old case. It's probably 15 years old the case, but it was well documented. That's why I took this case. Uh, now my my standard is uh, uh, mostly pedicure screws, and uh, uh, but at the top I, I like still to put transverse process hook to get a, a smooth uh, transition uh, at the top. Uh, you see, this case was a uh, hooks uh, at the upper thoracic spinal the way and patient did well. Uh, maybe in 10 years, somebody would come up uh, and say, well, we invented a fantastic new instrumentation. It's made of hooks. And that may, may happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but my, my current trend is a pair of screws all the way, uh, except at the uh, UIV where I put the uh, hooks, uh, trans-process hooks, uh, or sometimes laminar hooks uh, uh, to prevent uh, uh, proximal junction, okay, for see if it does. So that's the whole uh, thing, if it does. Yeah, and that's the ever-evolving topic. It seems like uh, everyone kind of goes based on their most recent failure, whether it's a tether or hooks or, you know, some other augmentation. Um, Aaron, would you mind continuing with the next case for us, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Alay and uh, Dr. Casper. Um, this is uh, this next case here. All right, uh, this was an 80-year-old female who uh, had presented to us uh, primarily complaining uh, that she was leaning over to her left side. Um, she has uh, an underlying degenerative uh, scoli and a prior um, L1 to 5 uh, instrumented fusion. Um, she had uh, undergone lateral discectomies um, uh, and uh, posterior instrumentation. Um, again, primarily complaining of uh, mechanical low back pain and this leaning over to the side. Uh, the pain is primarily constant uh, and achy in nature. Um, and uh, located primarily in her back. Uh, she did have some subjective uh, residual numbness in her right lower extremity. Uh, her neurological exam was benign with the exception of um, a, a positive uh, Hoffman's on the right side. These are her uh, AP and lateral x-rays. Uh, this is, uh, these are photographs of her. As you can see, she uh, really is uh, leaning uh, over there to the left. Um, the curve itself is approximately a 40 degree uh, coronal curve. Um, she's essentially required to, to lean onto something just, uh, just so that she can stand upright. Um, 
This is a, a, an, a sagittal and coronal CT um, uh, kind of demonstrating the prior fusion uh, and the coronal imbalance. Again, uh, the global uh, coronal imbalance was approximately 40 degrees um, with about 15 centimeters of uh, imbalance. Uh, the apex of the curve being over the L2, um, her um, pelvic incidence, uh, the mismatch was uh, approximately 17 degrees. So what we did actually was a, a PSO at L2 and then uh, did multiple smith Pete osteotomies um, uh, around the apex uh, and fused her from T6 to the pelvis. Um, and this is the, uh, the result we were able to obtain. Um, as you can see, the, um, the uh, um, coronal uh, imbalance is uh, markedly corrected and she has good sagittal, uh, overall good sagittal global alignment. Aaron, we, we did a symmetric PSO and it took a pedicle on one side, okay, so. Yes, sir. It's, 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 it's not, it's not um, maybe I should have done a, a complete PSO to get because she still has some residual imbalance, but uh, we did in this case a symmetric PSO because we thought uh, it was enough to remove one pedicle in this old patient's uh, and to correct her from the uh, uh, crushing on one side of the virtual body uh, and then being able to achieve the balance. And uh, also this patient, um, one thing you can see here, um, she was osteoporotic as well. Um, so additionally, we um, did cement augmentation there at the, uh, the top pedicle screw as well as the uh, UIV one and two, um, which uh, Dr. You often do, and we can see one hook as well here. You see uh -huh. <laughs> at the top. So, so let me ask a question. Um, now, obviously, she was way, way off balance. And in, in, in the picture you showed of her, she looked like a young kind of eighty. But, but in the deformity world, how often are you putting eighty-plus-year-olds through these kind of surgeries, particularly when they're osteopenic or osteoporotic? You know, with uh -huh you know, high incidence of complications. Is this a common operation in 80 plus year olds or is this kind of a unique case? No, I, I try to avoid it as much as possible to operate on 80 years old patient with a spinal deformity. Uh, but the, you know, <laughs> they still come to see you and once in a while you find a healthy 80 years old patient who is uh, very much, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, very much impaired by a spinal deformity, and you think uh, she's a good candidate. Uh, so some 80 years old, uh, you know, uh, uh, 70 years old, uh, behave like 70 years old patient. And these are the rare cases where you can uh, do this type of uh, correction deformity. Sure. I, th I think that's a great question and, and one to comment on. We also have uh, Dr. Colsaw on the line, who's who's one of our surgeons at Penn as well. And, and in situations like this with uh, more elderly patients, Amrit, are you... Um, are you asking them to come in with a loved one? Are you, you know, seeing this patient two to three times before you eventually sign them up for surgery? What's kind of your preoperative management of someone that might be undergoing an operation like this, you know, around 80 or even someone that's, you know, late 60s, early 70s? Yeah, great, great question, Dave. You know, I think uh, septuagenarians, octogenarians in my practice, I, I, uh, I echo uh, Vince's sentiments. I, uh, you know, I really try to not offer, uh, not opt them, you know, at all costs. Uh, but, but I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, if you find the right patient who, you know, um, you know, fits the profile of an operative candidate, um, you know, you just uh, really read them the riot act. I mean, I think everyone agrees with that and get as many family members on board as possible and just kind of you know, lay a lot of doom and gloom for them, um, you know, because, you know, even, you know, in patients like this, you may get a really great post-operative x-ray, but, you know, it's, it's several months following, uh, you know, the procedure that, you know, you're, you're also worried about. Uh, but, I mean, you, you can't, um, can't argue with this, this correction here. I mean, it was really, really nicely done. Vince, can, uh, it's Izzy Lieberman. Can I ask you for some of your pearls when you're doing an asymmetrical pedicle osteotomy, how do you preoperatively plan it and how do you execute it intraoperatively? So, so the first thing is, uh, uh, how do I uh, preoperate planning? So I, uh, you, you start with a, um, a bilateral Smith-Pete osteotomy at this level to, to make sure you're gonna control uh, all the nerves. 
And then once it's uh, done, you just go on this side of the uh, wedge resection, remove completely the pedicle. And from this side, obviously you try to go as much as possible to the opposite side, you know, resecting the cancerous bone from the opposite side. I'm not sure an asymmetric pedicle subtraction or sternomy works in a very young and healthy bone, like a 20 or 30 years old patients. But uh, in this uh, older adult patient who have osteoporotic bone, uh, things going to be, uh, you're going to be able to crush down the bones. And if it's not enough with the asymmetric pedicle subtraction or sternomy, you can always uh, convert it to uh, uh, just a regular uh, pedicle subtraction or sternomy. Uh, the only thing, it saves you a little bit of time so uh, to do it on a symmetric. And, uh, and when I see mostly a coronal imbalance, uh, I try to, to go with only a, an asymmetric PSO. But uh, in some cases, I had to do a, a regular PSO and just uh, fine tune the correction in the uh, complete range resection. That's great. Thank you, Vincia. We had a, a, a question in the chat box in relation to that. When you're looking at a curve, Vince, in terms of the uh, degree of coronal imbalance, is there a num numbers that you have in your head? You say, you know, they're 40 degrees off. I think I can do this with an asymmetric PSO. Um, it's going to do, I, I'm going to need multiple Schwab II osteotomies. Is there kind of an algorithm that you have in that, or, or is that more of a feel thing intraoperatively? In this patient, I had also the 5-1 dist I could work with. It would give me probably another 5 degrees. So uh, the asymmetric PSO in the coronal plane I think you can get 20 degrees, uh, 25, uh, how beyond this, it's, uh, uh, it's going to be difficult. Then just a follow-up question, you know, I don't have, you know, as much experience doing these three-column osteotomies and, uh, you know, osteoporotic population. I mean, how often do you find that these kind of um, end up being more VCRs and you have a harder time kind of controlling how much wedge you take out versus you end up just kind of, you know, taking the full Monty. I, I try as much as possible to do, you know, my algorithm, I try as much as possible to do, uh, to avoid the VCR, which I, I find are, are more, give you a, uh, more, more bit and more, more complications. So my algorithm in astronomy is obviously uh, uh, Smith beat, multiple Smith beat, uh, PSO and VCR. Uh, but uh, VCR for me is the last, last resort uh, uh, cases. Uh, so, and I try to do everything I can do. And I even I would do, uh, I would not hesitate to do an anterior uh, reconstruction, just ACR, if there's a, a mobile disc in the front to avoid doing a VCR. Because I find this ACR, you do it with minimal invasive surgery, you do it with a, an inch and a half long incision, you resect the disc, you put the I put out the cages and, and you get a huge correction, uh, if you, especially if you add a smith Peters and osteomy in the back. So for me, the VCR in these adult patients uh, have uh, become extremely rare, unless it's completely fused as a major, major deformity. That's great. Thank you, guys. Um, Stephen, would you mind taking on, uh, we'll, we'll head to the third case. Sure. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Um, yes. All right. So this gives us a uh, segue outside of a more degenerative e etiology. This case is a congenital um, uh, uh, etiology to his this 55-year-old gentleman's coronal imbalance. Um, briefly, he presented to clinic because he was also having back uh, as well as right lower extremity pain greater than left lower extremity. He had uh, associated significant neurogenic claudication. He wasn't able to walk greater than a block. He had a positive shopping cart sign, um, had tr struggles with his ADLs. And then on further imaging, as you can see, he definitely has a flat back deformity. His mismatch was in uh, around 25. He, on physical exam, he had a list to the left side, um, specifically on ambulation as we observed him in clinic. And he had notable weakness in the L5 distribution as well. Uh, on further imaging, a more detailed imaging, looking closely at the lumbosacral junction, he had this congenital S1 hemivertebra on the left side with notable, um, as well as stenosis at L3-4 and L4-5, which I'll show here um, on the images. This uh, shows that congenital left-sided S1 hemivert 
um, that, uh, as you can see here, caused an oblique takeoff at the lumbosacral junction um, that was pr the primary etiology for his uh, coronal imbalance, um, as well as some degenerative component that led to his flat back. Um, and so because of his symptomatology and failure of uh, conservative treatment measures, um, but here first, th this shows the level stenosis at 3.4 and 4.5. Um, and again, based on the, uh, his failure of conservative treatment measures, we elected to proceed uh, uh, with surgery. This involved- You, 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 sh you showed us uh, the MRI when you, you had an arrow on the MRI. So what is it? Oh, yes. So the arrow shows again, um, the, uh, uh, the congenital hemivertebra at S1, but also uniquely, he had uh, a unique anatomy that was noted on uh, during surgery that he had a conjoined nerve root of L5 um, that complicated part of the surgery, specifically when it came to doing our inner body fusion. Um, because uh, mobilizing the, the neural structures in order to safely place our inner body device was part of the difficulty that complicated it significantly. Um, and and, and we, we, we didn't pick up on the pre-op MRI. I, just, I think it's a, it's a post-review MRI that shows the conjoint nerve root. I, I don't think I picked up before the surgery. It's only yeah. when, during the case we saw this big, big nerve root, so it's conjoint nerve root. Yeah, so... Um, Basically, uh, we elected to proceed with a uh, resection of this congenital S1 hemivertebra, which included a three column osteotomy at the top of S1. Um, we did uh, bilateral posterior lumbar interbody fusions between L5 and S1 specifically to level that oblique takeoff so we can correct some of that coronal imbalance. And then we did posterior segmental instrumentation from uh, T11 to the pelvis including a four rod technique to uh, reinforce our construct. Uh, also to decompress his uh, stenosis that he had, he did, had laminectomies at three, four and four, five as well. Um, and this are his post-operative films that show that he had uh, excellent correction of his deformity. Um, uniquely, and I, we actually just saw him in clinic today, he had improved L5 uh, function uh, in his lower extremities and he uh, reported no pain. Uh, he's ambulating um, only occasionally with an assistive device, and he's only a few months out from surgery doing excellently. And his current x-rays are grossly unchanged from, uh, from surgery. Thanks, Stefan. That's a, that's a great case. Um, you're obviously going to be out in uh, the real world in a short year. Um, you're probably not going to see a lot of congenital S1 vertebral bodies, but... Um, Take me through what, what in your mind are some indications. I see you guys use four, um, four sources of fixation to the pelvis and then also a four rod construct. Take me through kind of your algorithm in terms of what you're going to do uh, regarding pelvic fixation. Why, why go with four versus two versus just S1? And then potentially additionally, when you're going to use uh, more than just two rods. Well, so I'm the most amateur uh, person in this esteemed group of um, <laughs> People. So I would have to say that with my limited knowledge, the understanding is the concern of developing a pseudoarthrosis um, low down, you know, the uh, getting a good anterior column support is the first thing. And second thing in order to just from ortho basic principles is to have good stability. Um, and uh, learning from Dr. Arlay is that adding the, the third and fourth rod adds, confers more stability to the construct, minimizing your risk of developing a pseudo um, at, that, uh, at that level. And, and I agree. I may just different. Okay, so I, I may overkill by putting four rods. Uh, the, 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 uh, and, you uh, think? Uh, you think? You uh, think four uh, rods is overkill? No, no. I'm, but the thing is, if we look at the UCSF study, they have more than 10% incident of rod breakage after five years. It would be, uh, I think they had five years for up in the adult deformity patient. My thing is, I, 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 do, I do maybe 70 to 100 adult spine deformity a year. And you see at your clinic, patients coming by three, four, five years and they break the rods. So it looks like if you only have, if you have a six or seven who come every year, which is the 10% cases, it, it's, uh, you have the impression you see that all the time. So I have changed my practice. And this is my former partner, Frank Shen, who has been instrumental in 
de uh, developing with me when I was at UV, the four rods technique. And then uh, I was lazy at the time. We just uh, de de described it. We did it on a few cases. I said, oh, it's not necessary. It's only on revision cases. We have to do four rods. But he continued to do it uh, on adult degenerative uh, spine. And he, he has a little amount of rod breakage. Uh, if you look at the UCSF studies, 10% of adult uh, deformity patients will get the rod breakage. It's huge. That means what, about with has... this, what about with this stiff a construct? Does anybody have any literature on the incidence of PJK above this type of stiff construct in a person of this age? What's, what's, uh, the, what's the chance? I agree with you. I don't have the number, and that's a concern, obviously. And so we don't bring the the stiff rods all the way up. Obviously, this is a big concern, and uh, it may precipitate uh, the proximal junctional care forces at the top. I agree. And, and Vince, so if the rods are breaking, obviously they have a pseudoarthrosis. So, do we need to pay more attention to the biology of the fusion? Because really, what you're relying on is the, you know, the strength of all the rods and the metal. And eventually, as Scott said, either they're going to get PJK, or as they get older, you know, these are going to break regardless, even if you have four in. I, I don't have the answer. The only thing I, I tell you is, is uh, I can't stand a patient where I did a, a, a successful spinal deformity three or four years before they come at four years and tell me, you know what, I just uh, uh, felt a pop in my back uh, about three weeks ago. I still got pain. And then, and then uh, a week later, they complain of second pop, and then you have the, the whole deformity that's uh, uh, back again. So uh, maybe there sh should be a middle ground just to have the four rods at the very bottom of the spine. And, and maybe the, even this case where it's not, not brought all the way to the top, uh, it should have been a little bit shorter. I agree. I, I don't have the answer. Uh, and maybe new metal would just uh, allow us to only go back to uh, two rods. Uh, but when you see, uh, when you do lots of uh, dot spiral deformity, you see all these uh, rod breakage. It's uh, <laughs> you, you, you're desperate. <laughs> Vince, can I can I pile on? You know, so you'll have all the TBI uh, uh, disc replacement guys going after you. My question <laughs> is: the ISSG uh, and the deformity guys have done a good job justifying the use of, um, of big hardware in these people by showing the, the health disability is equivalent to cardiac disease, et cetera. Has anyone followed the functional outcome of a 55-year-old now who's fused from his lower thoracic spine all the way down to his pelvis, who's got, you know, hopefully 30 more years uh, of function without a, uh, any mobility at all, um, you know, below T10. So has anyone gone forward to see, are, are we really doing these people a favor or, or maybe they're doing us a favor by breaking their hardware or breaking down at the proximal level? They're telling us that the, the, the body doesn't like this kind of a fusion in someone who's still active. I mean, obviously, this is a concern, the lack of mobility, but we have to see this patient, they cannot function, they come with excruciating pain and uh, the severe deformity, and we, uh, we fix them, and they have a very good quality of life afterwards if your surgery is successful uh, for many years to come. So now is it going to be the uh, uh, same in 20 years? Uh, he, would, uh, he may have uh, severe spinal stenosis at the top of his construct. I agree. He may have uh, thoracic myelopathy. He may have proximal junctional kyphosis. But you would have given this uh, gentleman 20 years of good life. And that's, uh, I don't think we can judge a, a result only one point of, uh, of time. It has to be judged on, on many, many, uh, all the month, all the years, yeah, and the patient had a good outcome. Yeah, I mean, unless we, we figure out a better way to make the transition, and Rick Geyer has been saying this for a long time, he thinks that there's some role in the future for motion preservation at the transition levels that would maybe uh, make it better uh, going long-term uh, for these patients rather than uh, an abrupt change in their mechanics. Absolutely. Well, the upshot, I'm all the, for it. Yeah, well, the upshot is your uh, rep working on commission had a very good day in the OR. <laughs> so. Oh, Scott, you're so cynical, but it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Vince. There's TBI guys that are on your side. <laughs> okay, thanks, Easy. <laughs> No, but Vince, it's true. We, 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 we give Izzy the same, the same trouble that we're giving you. We pick on no, the same we, way. We have, we have to work, obviously, on the transition. But I don't see, with everything that's written, I don't see today a, a good transition method. 
And uh, on the other hand, on the side, and, and what's very interesting, what's uh, been doing at Thierry Barnet, and you may have, you at TBI, some experience of uh, uh, long uh, uh, scoliosis construct on 12.4, uh, a patient would degenerate their lumbar disc at 4, 5, and 5, 1, and where you can do um, lumbar disc replacement. So what you experience in these patients, uh, uh, I don't have much experience on doing this, but that's what uh, Thierry Marnet has been doing in France on this patient who had this long uh, scoliosis construct to L4, L5, doing a disc replacement at the bottom level, and he pretends he has good results. Uh, you are you're doing lots of uh, this uh, disc replacement. Have you had the opportunity to do this on the patient who had a previous long uh, construct on 12.4 or L5? Vince, we have a small experience because uh, both David Bradford and Bart Sachs uh, got FDA approval to use disc replacements below long fusions um, as a compassionate uh, waiver. Um, and so we follow uh, a couple of Bart's patients who are now 10 and 15 years afterwards. And I have one patient who gets a facet rhizotomy at L5-S1 every year and is doing fine. So um, we have not had to revise any of that small number. And it'd be interesting uh, for somebody to follow up on, on who's that we're seeing Dave Bradford's few patients also, because they're very long term out now. And if none of them has been revised, maybe Terry Marnet is right. <laughs> maybe that is, you know, an alternative to fusing into the, uh, the pelvis. And yeah. what's, very, what's very interesting, he, he, he had the discussion with him, and in some cases, he, he was putting even cement in the, uh, in the L5 virtual body so he could put a disc replacement, which is yeah. quite... <laughs> yeah, Burton only does that too. He augments some of his artificial discs with cement. So, uh, so we're, waiting for, we're waiting for our Scully service to uh, ask us to uh, do motion at 4, 5, and 5, 1 on some of their long constructs. So we'll see. But you, you so know, the, we, the, we can do it on our own, Scott. The, Vince, uh, the problem is, the, and, and Jack is right. We we have a few patients in our you know in our practice like that, and I've done a couple as well. And the, you know they're pretty far out. The problem is they do get facet disease, as Jack said. Usually we treat that with rhizotomies and things like that. And I think that the current artificial discs that we have are not robust enough to take the tremendous forces of the long lever arm. And uh, but someday you know they'll come up with some devices that will be. So you're going to have to teach the robot how to uh, do that. You have to put program the software before you can do it with your... It's already done. Oh, got it. <laughs> but, you know, and, and the fellows get tired of hearing me say this, but I think in the future, I mean, look, you're doing the best you can do with what we have today, but I think in the future, we'll have some type of either flexible rods or some type of motion preservation uh, techniques that you can maintain the motion above these stiff uh, constructs. So it'll be sort of like a hybrid procedure. Now, I don't know what it's going to look like. I have some ideas, but, you know, who knows when it's going to be. Right now, we're yeah, doing, you I'm guys are doing it. the best you can do. Hey, I'm out for this, it. This is Jens. So this is a remarkably beautiful case, and I'm on your side, Evans, also. This is, uh, this is artistry, what you've shown there. Um, one of the chat room members, Mark Dekutowski, an old friend of ours, has asked, in the rebalancing of coronal deformities, uh, do lateral, meaning far lateral, inner-body fusions have a role? And if so, what strategy would you pursue, a concave or convex side approach? Thank you. I mean, I, I just, uh, do, I mean, the uh, far lateral, I use, uh, uh, I don't use X-stiff uh, technique. I use uh, anti uh, uh approach to the uh, spine when I need to, uh, Realign the patient. So, and I, I do it with a muscle sparing approach, which is uh, uh, maybe instead of doing a one centimeter incision, I do a, an inch and a half long incision, but I don't cut any muscles. And uh, so, in most cases, with because of the anti psoas approach I do, I do it on the convex side. I, on the, I do it, uh, excuse me, on the left side because of vascular anatomy. Okay, so in most cases, I do on, on the uh, on the left side because uh, uh, I think the Masculine anatomy is more friendly than on the right side. It's great that that spurred a lot of great discussion and uh, agreed on all accounts. Um, I think just to summarize in regards to the the fixation points, I know you know with a, a three column osteotomy having those four points of fixation, uh, six including the S one screws below that is obviously beneficial, and then. Um, having some more rods uh, across the, the osteotomy site, um, something to consider. Uh, Bilal, would you mind taking us through uh, the fourth case that we have here? And, and it looks like this might be our last one um, that we're able to get to. Yeah, uh, good evening. 
Okay. Uh, 47 year old male with back pain, no radiculopathy, worse with standing and activities and improvement of the back pain with the rest. Status post scoliosis surgery with Harrington Rhodes in 1984 from T10 to L4. In his past medical history, MI and Perthi disease. Long film x-rays with severe coronal and sagittal imbalance and lumbar flat back. In his pelvic parameters, we have mismatch of 47 degrees. We have lumbar kyphosis, three degrees, and we have scoliosis from T10 to L5, 32 degrees. CT myelogram, he had fusion from T10 to L4, L4, L5 facets are not fused and there is no compression on the sac. Axial cuts with a huge fusion mass from T10 to L4, L4, L5, L5, S1 not fused. On his uh, cervical thoracic MRI, no significant uh, stenosis or cord compression. And the question, what do we do? What we did in the first stage, we did ALF, L4, L5, L5, S1 with extensive release and over distraction with paddle distractors and putting hyperlordotic cages which were undersized in order to rotate them and fixation of the cages on one of the end plates. At the second stage, pontiosteotomy from L4 to S1 and connection of the uh, rods to the Harrington instrumentation, and also doing compression on the convex side and distraction on the concave side. And the patient at eight months follow up doing well, balanced coronally and sagittally. Thank you. Thanks, Bilal, I appreciate that. Um, Bilal, sometimes in these patients that have prior hardware in or uh, are undergoing their third or fourth surgery. Oftentimes the anatomic structures are obscured. It's tough to get landmarks. Um, what has your experience been in finding these, these starting points? And, and then maybe I'll bump that up to, to Vince. In a case like this, um, are you having to, to open up the canal at a lot of points to kind of feel the pedicles? I know, um, I know uh, you, you use navigation and advanced techniques like that. Um, more sparingly, and that, that has to do with the fact that, you know, you're a wizard at finding the pedicles, but uh, any tips or tricks in a patient like this? Uh, in Jerusalem, what we used, we used the robot. We pre-plan on the robot and we insert the screws according to the trajectories, okay? And one of the ways is to open the canal, but this patient has a huge fusion mass. It was according to the OR report, three centi of fusion mass. So, uh, may, may I comment, I, I think obviously, uh, you can use navigation and robotic uh, surgery. Uh, uh, I, I use I'm a, an old-fashioned surgeon, and uh, in these cases, uh, uh, obviously, uh, I try to identify the landmarks of the um, pedicle. Uh, sometimes there is no landmark for the previous pedicle. Uh, if there is a previous instrumentation which is embedded in the fusion mass, uh, it's, it's important to leave it in because you can use this and to cross-link it to use wedding band to the previous instrumentation that's gonna be extremely solid. So don't take out the previous instrumentation if it's embedded in the previous fusion mass, and that's going to give you lots of fixation point. Uh, second thing uh, you can do, uh, you can just plan out which pedicles are easy to find. Usually the convex side pedicles are easy to find, and if you uh, uh, have hard time to find landmark for the convex pedicle, you can use a CRM fluoroscopy rainbow the CRM fluoroscopy and you're going to find easily convex pedicle and if you can put a screw on the CRM fluoroscopy to, to get your screws in the, in the uh, fusion mass. Uh, last thing, if you don't find anything in the fusion mass, something that goes very fast, doesn't go, you put hooks, you drill and you, you put your uh, uh, laminar hooks and you can put multiple laminar hooks so you don't even need to have an x-ray or anything, you put hooks and if you uh, put them in a you know, compression distraction configuration and you crossing to the opposite rod is going to be extremely solid. So, uh, uh, but uh, maybe I should ask Easy, who has a great experience in Easy, are you here? Yep, I'm still here. So why don't you just comment on this uh, robotic uh, uh, cases? You have uh, one of the uh, uh, most experienced in the country of robotic surgery. So why don't you uh, tell us your, your, what, you, what you do uh, 
for this kind of spine where you have a pre extensive previous fusion mass? The, one of the first things, it's, it's not the robot as much as the preoperative planning that's important. It's coming to the operating room prepared. That's really the key. Knowing what your goals are and setting up the steps of the surgery to get there. Uh, when you've got the preoperative CT scan, you can actually see what you pointed out, uh, Vincent, that some of the hardware is embedded in bone. And you can strategize ahead of time. You can say, listen, I'm going to leave this in. I'm going to put a cross link here, link to a new rod or a, a lateral or a domino connector on this. And you can build from a solid foundation and move uphill or downhill with that. With the preoperative planning and you've got the CT scan, you can also see where the other screws are placed. So if you remove the screw, it makes it much easier to decide, can I use that same screw hole? If you can, that's great. If you can't, the preoperative planning also allows you to, some circumstances, get new screw holes through there without deviating off. So you know that you can cross the previous screw hole or you can find good bone elsewhere. And then if you've got a, a really robust fusion mass, uh, you can spend hours digging through it trying to find the, the inside of the pedicle through a laminotomy-based uh, approach or coming at it from lateral. But with the pre-op planning, again, you can mark that landmark and you can see exactly where you want it to be. The other thing that I've done uh, quite a bit of with the pre-op planning is plan the osteotomies through previous fusion masses. So I will drill partial holes across and line up the osteotomy. Uh, I'll put K wires down through the pedicle, uh, keep things going so I know my trajectories on that and really just plan the osteotomies ahead of time and then execute with the robot. So there's a lot of things that you can do with it. Uh, and it's not the hardware as much as the software that allows you to come to the operating room prepared. Thank you. Well, that's great, everyone. Thanks so much um, for all of those who attended. Um, I really appreciate the Seattle Science Foundation for putting this on. And um, if there's no other uh, questions or comments from any of the panelists. Uh -huh. I, I saw a question from Mark Dekutowski, but I couldn't treat the the, uh, the, uh, the bottom of his line. So I, I saw his name popping up for a question, but I couldn't read the question. Can you read it, uh, David? Yeah, yeah absolutely. What's his question? Um, so the, the question is in regards to the commercial software. Does it encourage uh, the under-informed surgeon to dive in? Um, essentially saying, you know, does, does a surgeon that hasn't maybe had the experience of someone as Dr. Lieberman, are they going to tackle a case that maybe they otherwise shouldn't because they feel confident with the robot? So let, let me jump in on, on that one quickly. Uh, I've been saying for many years that the robotics and the preoperative planning is not going to make a bad surgeon good. It makes a good surgeon more precise and more efficient. Yeah, I'd, I'd absolutely echo those uh, those sentiments. It seems like if you're put in a position and for some reason the software fails or the, the robot fails, if you can't rely on, you know, basic anatomy and, and your feeling of, uh, you know, comfort around the spine itself, it seems like navigation or a robot aren't going to get you out of that. So I, I'd certainly echo those comments that it really, uh, it cements a foundation based in, you know, anatomic findings intraoperatively and can really supplement that as opposed to kind of just being uh, the end all be all. Absolutely. Thank you guys, Dave, Evans and the Penn Fellows. Good job, great discussion and uh, really appreciate it. You guys right. take Thank care, you, we'll Penn. see you soon. Uh, thanks Everybody very stay much. Well. Okay. okay. Take care. Take care. Night, Thank guys. you. Yeah. Thank thanks. you. Thanks guys. Thanks Vince. Good job Vince. Thank you. Strong work Vince. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Good to see you. Long time not seen. Hopefully, you should be able to see you soon. I hope yeah. so. Yeah, well, so. It's outstanding. Okay, yeah, and say, how, how are you doing, buddy? Okay, so, it's great. So, no, last time I saw you, was, we were in Spain together, okay? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and here we are.
Here we're just flipping around. I haven't had a vacation in basically all year. So I hope we can uh, meet again under socially acceptable circumstances. Absolutely. Okay. Looking forward to it. And you're, you're an artist Thank you. with the spine. It's a privilege to see and no, learn No, from no, no, because, Thank because you. I, 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 I show the good cases, okay? So somebody's going to pull my, my uh, bad cases, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.